Well, hey, everybody, and welcome back to the Camino Church Lessons podcast. We are glad you've joined us again and hope and pray that you enjoy these podcasts and that they are meaningful uh, and provide understanding for you in your scripture reading and in your theology. Uh, and if they do, uh, be sure to subscribe to the podcast wherever you download your podcast from or go to Camino Church's YouTube channel and subscribe to it there and you can watch and listen to the podcast. And if it's good for you, how about sharing it with people around you? That way they can benefit from it as well. well we're continuing this time uh, with the study of 3rd John, another very short letter as we mentioned when we talked about 2nd John, one sheet of papyrus and that's all it would have taken to write this letter. And there's a very specific point that uh, the, the author is trying to make. And as we have discussed with First and Second John, I think the author of Third John is also uh, John uh, the Apostle. And this time, the bad religion issue is bad leadership in the church. And it's a unique letter because John is actually writing it to an individual, not to the church at large. And that individual is Gaius, who's going to receive this letter, read it, may read it in front of the church, uh, but it's definitely meant for him and him alone as far as the direction that he is getting for how to lead the church and the support that he will get from John as, as he writes it. There are two other characters involved in this, Diotrephes and Demetrius. And Diotrephes is going to be known as kind of the, the Mr. Intimidator, the bad manager, the bad leader in the church because of his behavior. Uh, but before we condemn him too much, let's remember that some of the issues he's going to be charged with uh, are possibly related to previous direction that John has given. Remember in 2 John, John was very clear that the church should not welcome false teachers into their homes and show them hospitality and host them. Well, that's one of the issues with Diotrephes is that he is condemning those who would welcome uh, who this author considers to be friends. So maybe Diotrephes is confused. We don't know. We don't get clarity on that. But, uh, but he is the bad example. Uh, the other good example is Demetrius, Mr. Dependable, uh, if you will. And as we read the letter, we will, we will see how each one of them is encouraged or admonished for what they do on behalf of the church. And as we do read it, uh, let's keep in mind that probably... At this time, as the church is in very early stages of its existence, trying to figure out uh, the gospel and theology of Jesus Christ, one of the questions that is probably starting to come to the fore is, what kind of church should they be? And, and, and you can apply that question to the church at large, but you can also apply that question to every individual church. What does that church need to be in its setting? What does that church need to be for its current congregation? What does that church need to be for the people who live around them in the community that they are situated in? It's a great question that we all should ask, um, and this is what they're trying to address somewhat in this letter. And it's really being asked more specifically is, what kind of church leader will define the nature and character of our church? And we're going to see three. And there's going to be clear direction and implications from John. This is another one of those where he's going to try to persuade and dissuade in the same letter. Persuade the church or persuade Gaius to go in a particular direction and dissuade him from another direction. So it would at least appear that Gaius is kind of caught between the tension of two individuals in his church which could represent two factions within his church and how they are behaving. Uh, and, and John is going to ask him the question, basically, as he writes this letter, who are you going to be? And that kind of tells me that either Gaius is the leader or host, house host for this church, this house church, or John needs him to be. Uh, we today are also kind of still on the hot seat to determine the nature and character of our churches. So this really speaks to us well even today. Who are we going to be in this current culture? Who are we going to be to the people around us? Who do we need to be as a church to the people who attend our church? These are all very important matters, uh, and, they, and they change and they ebb and flow. Uh, but 
the, the essence of the issue is always in place. Um, and at least uh, in uh, the modern United States, one of the dynamics that we see that uh, is happening is churches are still closing at an alarming rate. Uh, and of course, we've been through uh, some situations that have kind of caused some of that to happen, but before any issue that may have caused a church to close, and I would argue it will continue afterwards, churches are closing because they cannot relate to changing culture. And I want to be real clear with this. The message never changes. The message of who Jesus Christ is and who we are as followers and how we become followers through salvation never changes. But the methods do. And the methods need to match the culture around us not that we compromise the message, but that we reach people through some of their communication methods, some of their engagement methods, and then we give them the honest, true message. And so a lot of these churches that are closing, and most of them are Protestant churches, uh, they're, be, they're closing because they would never change their approach. Uh, they're still doing church, and they're still doing ministry as if it's 1950, 1940, or even 1960, 70. And that is not where we are anymore. Uh, and so they need to update uh, based on what culture is. And again, they're not compromising their theology. They're not compromising the good news. Not at all. But what they're doing is choosing a method of delivery that matches the current culture. Look at what Jesus did. Jesus spoke in parables that met the needs of the people because it's where they were. Look at Paul. Paul said, I will be all things for the gospel. I can, I can be uh, a type of person or take a type of approach or come with a particular communication style that matches wherever I am. Not that I will change the message of Jesus Christ. Paul st stuck to it with amazing strength. But I'm going to present it in a way that people will listen. So we still ask these questions of us today. That doesn't change. So as we read this, think about your own church. If you are a church goer, and if you are not, you know, where can you plug in as a church uh, to a church so that you can have an impact on the community around you? So let's jump into this letter, just like Second John. It's short. It won't take us long, but we're going to touch on a few things as we roll through this so that we better understand what the Scripture is telling us today. So it opens up with a similar greeting as Second John, the elder same author that we saw in 2 John, to the beloved Gaius, whom I love in truth. And we're already hitting that word truth again. We've hit it through all of John's epistles. Uh, the difference in this letter, again, is it's addressed to one person. It is not addressed to the church at large. And Gaius, if we go a, do a little bit more research within our scriptures, the New Testament, uh, the name Gaius shows up in Acts chapter 19. Um, as, as a person of the church, uh, at, Gaius also shows up in Paul's letters in 1 Corinthians chapter 1 and in Romans chapter 16. Um, if you go back to an ancient writing written somewhere in the late 300s called the uh, Apostolical Constitutions, and you read that, it is a, a writing about the moral conduct of the church about how to do liturgy and how to organize a church. It's very, much a, um, it's very much a structural letter on how the church should be and behave. But in that letter, and it probably was written in Antioch, uh, we think, uh, but in that letter, it notes that the Gaius in Acts 19 is the same as the Gaius in 3 John. So Gaius seems to be someone who, who has come into this new faith and is rose up into leadership positions, uh, not only for Paul, but for John here uh, and in the church. So probably a very well-known person, uh, but seems to have some infighting within his church that John here is trying to address. So when you get a chance, go back and read Acts 19, right around verse 29. You'll see his name, but read, read before and after that so you can see the context. Uh, 1 Corinthians chapter 1, and again Romans chapter 16, and in that Romans right around verse 23. John goes on to say, Beloved, I pray that all may go well with you 
and that you may be in good health, just as it is well with your soul. Now, it's interesting that uh, opening part of this passage or the scripture verse, all may go well, literally means to have a good journey. So it's almost like saying, I hope your spiritual journey, your journey of life goes well with you. And it goes beyond just regular health. I mean, it's, it's more of a, of a greeting of, I hope all of your life is, is going well. Verse 3, I was overjoyed when some of the friends arrived and testified to your faithfulness to the truth. And we know for John, truth is so very important. That's a doctrinal statement. Gaius is faithful to the truth, to the doctrine, which means he has overcome some of the issues in 1 John and 2 John with these false teachers, these Gnostics who were teaching uh, incorrectly about Jesus Christ. Testified to your faithfulness to the truth, namely how you walk in the truth. So Gaius is good doctrinally, but he is also good ethically. He walks the way he believes, which is truth. I have no greater joy than this to hear that my children, term of endearment, are walking in the truth. Boy, we have hit truth, gosh, what, four times, three, four times already, and we're only in verse 4. So clearly the similarities with 1 John and 2 John are still there. Verse 5, Beloved, you do faithfully whatever you do for the friends. And the literal word there is brothers, uh, but the implication is for all believers, even though they are strangers to you. So we've talked about Gaius' good doctrine. We've talked about Gaius' good ethics. And right here, John encourages and recognizes him for his good hospitality. We mentioned this in 2 John, that uh, at that time, John is encouraging the people not to show hospitality to the false teachers. But here, for the brothers and sisters in Christ, for the friends, you are to show that hospitality, even if you don't know who they are but you know that they live and speak in the truth. And that's what Gaius is doing. He, re he recognizes that uh, in verse 5 for him. Verse 6, they have testified to your love before the church. You will do well to send them on in a manner worthy of God. The implication there is you send them on with spiritual support, with prayer and encouragement, and material support. And that is part of your commitment because you hosted them. So clearly, the people who are probably doing the most hosting are those who have the means to do so, right, in this early church formation. But send them on in a manner worthy of, of God, for they began their journey for the sake of Christ, accepting no support from non-believers. So they are kind of implies that they are missionaries for the cause. Therefore, we ought to support such people so that we may become co-workers with the truth. I have written something to the church, but Diotrephes, who likes to put himself first, does not acknowledge our authority. So now we've heard the good stuff that uh, Gaius has done. Now we're going to hear the things related to Diotrephes. And the first thing is, is that uh, he is he's poor leader. He does not lead well because he has put himself first. He likes it, as a matter of fact, which seems to be a pride issue. And there's some ego involved here. He also does not acknowledge, quote, our authority, says John, the authority of the community, the truth. Uh, and so he is, he, there's, John is not secure with Diotrephes' ability to follow truthful authority. We don't know how he does that yet, but, but John's kind of going ahead and calling out some of, some of his overall issues. He says, so if I come, this is verse 10, so if I come... I will call attention to what he is doing in spreading false charges against us. That's a bit of a threat, it sounds like. John is saying, if I show up, I'm going to publicly call him out in front of the church uh, so that they know that what he is doing is wrong uh, and that he is spreading false charges against uh, John and his group. So, so not only does he not follow their authority, uh, he is critical of them. And I'm sure in uh, from John's point of view, this is very much um, a defamation issue, uh, that if they continue to let Diotrephes do that, John and those who do follow him in the truth will lose their standing with the church, and the church will then become disconnected. And continuing on there with verse 10, and not content with those charges, 
All right, so if that's not enough, he refuses to welcome the friends. He does not welcome the brothers in like Gaius does, and even prevents those who want to do so and expels them from the church. So he himself doesn't welcome them, but he doesn't allow others to either. He's not practicing the hospitality that he should that probably John has instructed the church on. Verse 11, Beloved, do not imitate what is evil, but imitate what is good. Whoever does good is from God. Whoever does evil has not seen God. So after John has laid out this comparison of Gaius, which is good, the things that he does is good, and Diotrephes, things that he does are evil, he says, you need to do what is good. And they would know the answer. It's clear as a bell in here uh, what the answer should be and not do what is evil. Again, persuade and dissuade. And then he gives them another example. Everyone has testified favorably about Demetrius. Here's another good example. Let's see what Demetrius does. And so has the truth itself. Demetrius has the truth. We also testify for him, and you know that our testimony is true. So Demetrius is a good person. He has support of the church, and he lives. He is a testimony of the truth. Again, over and against uh, Diotrephes, but in line with Gaius. And then after he has, John has laid out this very clear but very short um, uh, discussion about what is good and what is evil, um, he's really saying to them again, what kind of church will you be? He ends with this final greeting. I have much to write to you, but I would rather not write with pen and ink. Instead, I hope to see you soon, and we will talk together face to face. This uh, final greeting sounds so much like the second John final greeting. Peace to you. The friends send you their greetings. Greet the friends there, each by name. Now, there's probably or possibly one of, another issue playing underneath this letter uh, in the life of the church. By the time we get to 3 John, uh, we are, I would say, at least at the end of the first century, uh, 90 A.D., possibly as far along as 110. Once you get into the 100s and right around 115, 120, uh, you begin to see a consistent development of, of church leadership, uh, what is known uh, historically as the monarchical uh, episcopacy, which means the church now has structure, uh, a form to it, things that we may know as deacons and elders and, and pastors and things like that. The early church wouldn't have had much of that. They were just trying to get together. There would have been a host, uh, someone who, who brought people into their home for the church. <clears throat> that person may or may not have been who did the teaching or who did the facilitation. That could have been someone else. But <clears throat> it didn't have a whole lot of structure. They were just starting and surviving. But by the time you get to the end of the first century and the beginning of the second century, there is structure. Uh, and you can begin to maybe see that in what is happening in this third John letter. And here are some of the issues that, that they may be dealing with that Diotrephes may actually kind of be part of or embedded in that may be causing this issue. Uh, one is uh, who... Who is going to have authority over the churches? Up until now, the authority has been uh, what we would call apostolic authority, the authority of the apostles. But now the apostles are dying out, uh, and John is left, and maybe just John at this point. And so who has authority? And this is when the role of bishop begin, uh, kind of begins to come in play in a much more stronger area because the apostles will no longer be the, the bishops or the church leaders. It will be another generation of leaders, of men who will lead these churches primarily. Some women too, without a doubt. Uh, Phoebe is an example, um, and, and there are some others. But who is going to be in charge, and what direction 
will they take the church? So as you move from apostolic authority to, uh, to bishop authority, what's going to be that movement? Does Diotrephes have aspirations of being a bishop? Right? And a bishop over a, uh, maybe even a group of churches, small churches. So he is exerting his leadership style, which is not a good one. It is not facilitative and encouraging. It is more of a, uh, a control uh, and, and one that is filled with punishment or negative consequences when you don't do what you're supposed to. He's expelling people from the church when they show hospitality. So, that, so maybe he is trying to, to put himself in a position that allows him to begin to take control. The other thing, and this is one that we still see today and work with, is where is the control over the church? Is it local control or is there a larger church uh, control, uh, Catholic control? And that's not Catholic specifically. I'm talking about Catholic, the larger church. At least in my background, I'm very familiar with the Baptist Church, which is much more local control, um, as against, uh, as opposed to uh, the Catholic Church, the Presbyterian Church, the Methodist Church, Lutheran Church, and so forth, where there is a little bit more of control from a, a board of elders or a leadership group that, that may not even be within the church, uh, and so that may be playing out here as well. And I think what John is saying, or one of the lessons that John is trying to give us is, is that that may not be the most important thing. The most important thing is going to be knowing the truth and living by the truth. And I would argue that is part of our issue even still today. Too many churches have gotten caught up in um, the administration and the authority, the ruling of the church. And their emphasis is in that area, and they get a lot of pride and satisfaction out of it, much like Diotrephes. But what they're not doing is emphasizing the truth and ethically living the truth. So as we leave 3 John, we're going to head toward Jude next time and see what Jude has to say about bad living. And that last in our little series of bad religion here. But as we leave 3 John, let us remember that we need to know the truth, we need to walk in the truth, and we need to ensure that our assemblies are doing the same thing. So, thanks for joining us again. We'll see and talk to you again next time. And hopefully we'll, uh, we'll enjoy a little run through Jude. Oh, and then right after that, we'll have a guest. And this is a good one. You're going to be excited to hear this gentleman talk. He is fantastic. And he has an amazing uh, history, background, and story uh, to help share with us when it relates to these letters. Thanks a lot. Remember to stay in the Word, and let's keep this journey going.